You're listening to Mortgage Lending Mastery. Get the knowledge you need to advance your mortgage practice quickly and efficiently from Jen Duplessis, America's Mortgage Mastery Mentor with over 37 years of experience and over $1 billion in lifetime funding. Jen has been mentoring loan officers and realtors for over 15 years and speaking on stages across the globe. So settle in and get ready as Jen and her guests share their experience passion and strategies to help you crack the top producer code to reach new heights in your business. And now here's your host, Jen Duplessis, mortgage mastery mentor and head chick in charge of Kinetic Spark Consulting. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Mortgage Lending Mastery. I'm your host, Jen Duplessis. I want to say thank you again for joining us every single time that we release these. I hear all these beautiful stories of what you're doing while you're listening to this podcast and just keep them coming. It's exciting. It's absolutely exciting. But I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to us and welcome our guest today, Chris Larson. Welcome to the show, Chris. Jen, thanks. It's awesome to be here with you. Yeah, it's great. We were just talking in the green room about all of our investing, and we were talking about the fact that you live in beautiful Asheville, North Carolina. For those of you that don't know where that is, go look it up. The great Biltmore is there, and um, I'm telling you, that place is absolutely incredible. Um, And I'm not going to tell you anymore. Well, it's a Vanderbilt home. That's really basically what it is. But let me tell you a little bit about Chris. He, uh, He went to Virginia Tech, which is really cool because he's here and, you know, was here in Virginia, went to Virginia Tech, uh, Tech got his degree in engineering, bio engine, biochemical engineering, um, and then started buying real estate and the rest is history. And that's why he is here. He is the founder of Next Level Income. And the reason why I have him on the show, because most for you, Chris, most of the people that are listening to the show are real estate agents real estate investors and mortgage lenders. And, you know, I love that you're reaching to this next level income in the context of real estate, because this is something I've done in my, my entire four decades of being in the lending businesses. Um, And I know this is what you did from being an engineer is like, wow, I have my job, but then there's life beyond that right next level income. And so um, I want to be able to share that with our listeners so that they can share it with their clients and so that they can do it for themselves as well. So um, happy to have Andrew, the author of next level income. I'll let you show that real quick here and not real quick, but yeah. Next level income. It's like playing Monopoly, right? We talk about that all the time. It is. Monopoly in this industry. So welcome. We are so excited to have you here today. Thank you, Jen. No, I'm excited to be here. And yeah, we were talking before. I I I raced bicycles for 20 years. I still ride, but uh, yeah, rode up and up and over many of the roads right around. Yeah, beautiful. I know we received that. Yeah, that's, Virginia, where you live. That's funny. Well, um, I've stopped a couple of those bike riders here because, you know, they're on the dirt roads and stuff. And, you know, I've ca- I stopped a couple of them and said, hey, if you're ever riding by, we have a whole refrigerator full of water in here if you need. Oh, wow. <laughs> I wish I knew, man, I wish I knew yeah. that. I would have I, I would have been knocking on your door like, hey, yeah. Right. Although, I mean, I, t- I had some cold rides in the snow up and over Mount Weather. Ooh, oh, yeah. No, yeah, we yeah, wouldn't need they- a hot chocolate those days. Yeah, <laughs> right. it gets it gets brutal up there. Yeah, um, definitely does. Yeah, but uh no, I appreciate that. I look, I had, I had my real estate license. So if you're listening, if you're an agent, if you're in the business, um, I started in the residential space and yeah, I'd love to talk about, you know, next level income, which is really how to create these passive level, these passive income streams yeah. to really create true freedom. So let's, so let's just start when, you know, you started investing when you were 21, which I beat you, by the way, we bought our first house when we were 19. Awesome. Still, that's that's still, amazing. We still have it. It was it was in May before and we got married in July. We just celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary last week. Wow. Weekend. Congratulations. And thank you. And uh yeah, so we bought the house before we before we got married in May so we could work on it. Yeah, so you started investing in when you're 21. Now, at 21, were you still at Virginia Tech at that time? Is that when you said, "Hey, I'm going to buy one of the houses here for student housing?" I was. So I was a I was a junior. And I was renting a house, renting um, from a yeah. friend just down the way in a townhouse, renting a room. Yeah. And one popped up on the market, and the, like the oven was broken, and there were some issues. I hadn't re-signed my lease, and I saw this place for sale, and I thought, well, shoot, I can do this too. And my parents had a couple of rentals, so I was familiar with it. Right. And it was at a time when I was investing in the stock market, and I was starting to investigate other 
opportunities for investment. And you mentioned my book and look, if you're listening to and you want to get a copy, just check us out at nextlevelincome.com. Click on the book link and I'll even send you a copy if you put your address in. Perfect. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So how did you buy that first house? Because I know that's something everyone's going to be asking. I mean, I know how we did it, but how did you do it? Yeah. So, you know, it, look, it was, it was a $90,000 townhouse mm-hmm. and I had my mom co-sign on the loan with me. I had, I had, I already had a credit card. I had, I had credit, but I didn't have income. I was still a student. Right. I didn't have a steady job. Right. Um, so I had a co-borrower. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a FHA loan and I put, it was less than $3,000 down yeah. and I eventually paid my mom back and that's how I got in there. And then I did, now we call it house hacking, but yeah. you know, I rented out two of the three bedrooms and I essentially paid for my, my mortgage at the time. That's how I got started. Yeah, that is so cool. And I guess I love those kinds of stories. I mean, I really do. Those are the coolest ways to get started. And it's in fact, how my, my son got started in his investment as well. And um, now they have like 19 properties or something. And awesome. Um, awesome. yeah, I mean, it just continues to grow and, and uh, you know, I mean, and a lot of people just don't think that way. So what do you think was, I mean, granted your mom and dad had that, you saw it um, coming. What happened with the, so for example, you're living in this house and you're renting out, you know, right. a room in this house. Did you bring your buddies with you and say, Hey guys, I bought the house. Now you can come with me. Yeah, it was something like that. So I, yeah, I put a strategy together. So I was day trading in the stock market. I was actually making about five thousand dollars a month. So yeah, I was I was racing my bike and I quit racing my bike. So I had all this extra time and energy, and I didn't want to be an engineer. I figured that out really quickly. Into <laughs> Me too. My Notice degree. I'm not one. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You know, but you still can think. <laughs> yeah. You still learn and think like oh, an yeah. engineer. But I, yeah. I was like, I can't see myself doing this. Yeah. So I was like, I want to be an investor. And I really liked the option of real estate where you could have leverage. So you could buy a $90,000 property for less than $3,000 down. You could have control. So you could control the price that you bought it and you could control the income that you had. So yeah, I had, I had a couple of friends come and rent for me and then you can scale real estate. So I ended up buying the townhouse next door. So, you know, I had six quote unquote units within, you know, a very, can compact space. And then I just just kept buying from there. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Okay. So, so you're buying some properties, right. And you, when you graduated, were you, and then did you go into engineering or did you just stay as an investor? No. So, um, so yes and no. So I, or no and yes, as it would (laughs) answer your question. (laughs) So I, I didn't want to be an engineer. I looked right. at the different options that were out there. Um, and I actually applied to the business school for an MBA. And frankly, my, my grades weren't fantastic in engineering, but I was accepted in the, into the MBA program. And I also was fortunate enough to get a, um, a, like a, like was in a work study program. So I worked for oh, the yeah. university, yep. which yep. was wonderful. So I ended up working for the university and I kept, I really love finance. So I was like, Hey, if I like, if I really like real estate, I really like finance. Um, I'm going to look at doing a career like this. And I almost actually got a PhD in finance, but then I found out that PhDs don't even make as much money as just an MBA. Right. And they all seem miserable to me. And yes. I was like, man, that's just, I'm not going to keep doing this. Yeah. Um, so I, I was finishing up school and I'd already bought my second property and I was on my way to my, I either had already bought or was on my way to buying my third property as well. And I was running out of money, right? I was running out of capital. Mm. So because right. And you know, you're in the mortgage business. So you start to run up against these, these limits and you're running out of capital. So I was like, well, I have to go, I have to go find you know, a Options. job to create some more capital. Yeah. Um, and I, during this time period, I read about 250 books over a four or five year period. And I was in the bookstore. I'd, I just, every, every week, practically I'd go in the bookstore and I'd be looking at the finance section. And this, this gentleman is, is, looks over to me and he says, Hey, and this is probably 99, 2000, somewhere around 2000. He looks at me, he goes, are you looking for something to read? And I said, yeah. And he holds up this, this black and purple book. And it was rich dad, poor dad. Yeah. And he goes, you should read this book. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. okay. So, yeah. cause I mean, I, I, re- I was reading about a book a week. So I was like, sure, yeah. I'll read it. Yeah. So I read it and that was the, like, none of the other books had come out at the time. So I read that and I was like, yeah, this makes sense. And R- Robert Kiyosaki, and I have actually have a copy that Robert himself gave me here in my um, book cabinet. He's, he said in the book that 
if you want access to the best investments out there, you need to be accredited. And I was like, well, what's this? And yeah. accredited simply means, and you, I know you know this, Jen, um, but you make $200,000 or more a year in income. And I said, okay, I want to do that. I want to have access to these types of investments out there. And, you know, I'm, I'm still in my MBA program. So you can't be accredited through your net worth, which is a million dollars or more if right. you're in college, but you can get a high paying job. And I, I kind of <laughs> stumbled and was fortunate enough to come upon the medical device industry. And with my um, engineering background, and, and I also had a sales background as well. I started selling wrapping paper door to door at age 12, if you oh, can wow. believe that. Yep. yep. I, I was think like, we've all sold is... wrapping paper from school. There, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Part of, part, part of uh, J, J, what, junior achievement or something. Yeah. Yeah. It was some like, but anyway, um, it's amazing all the lessons you learn by like, you know, cold calling and knocking on doors. And, oh yeah. Um, now, now I don't even think you can allow kids to go door to door by themselves. Right. right? Um, but uh I, I thought this was the most amazing career. And when I, when I met somebody that did it, they told me how much he made. He was definitely into that accredited status. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. So yeah. I put my head down and this is kind of where I went off track a little bit. I put my head down. I already had um, several properties at this point. Um, I, I kept my head down for about 10 years as I kind of built my career and, and started to become more successful. Um, and I really, at that point, I was just trying to create enough capital to really pay off the mortgages of the properties I had. So I didn't have to work anymore. That was kind of, that was kind of my first really simple plan towards yeah. financial independence. Step investing is what that's called. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I love that. I love that. And using the snowball effect, you know, that Dave Ramsey uses, which was before Dave Ramsey, because we use that same, you know, thing. We didn't need the money, right? Yeah. Because you have a job. And yeah. so all the proceeds or proceeds, the net income go yeah. into paying off all the debt. Yeah. I love it. I love that. So, so you, um, because, you know, a lot of loan officers that are listening, um, they already know, you know, we, we are maxed out. I'm, I'm not, you know, in the business anymore, but, it, you know, know that we're maxed out at, you know, some places four, some 10, some 14, 13, depends on whatever, you know, and I ran into that same situation where I wasn't able to even qualify for a mortgage myself. And so I had to find outlet sources. So where's the first place that you went at that time. And, and then let's compare that to where you go now. And, and obviously you're doing a lot of commercial now, but tell us a little bit about that transition, because um, I think this is really important. I think this is where a lot of traditional residential realtors and loan officers kind of step back and say, oh, well, that's all commercial. And in fact, it's not commercial. I, it's not commercial because I don't go to banks. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, we just actually just had somebody on our podcast and we were talking about hard money lending. So yeah. there's there's all kinds of different things you can do. So yeah. you can partner with somebody that has enough credit, that has enough, um, you know, yeah. not even credit, but the ability, right? That hasn't hit those limits. Yeah. And at the time it was 10, like 10 mm -hmm. mortgages that you could get. Um, and I was in Virginia at the time, Virginia yeah. resident. Yeah, and that um, was, yeah, and that was okay. And that worked out for a while and then it went away yeah. and came back again. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, yeah, all my lines of credit were pulled during the financial yeah. crisis, all that. So you can partner with people, which is a great option. You can do hard money lending, which is essentially, they just lend on the asset value itself. Um, and you can also do portfolio loans. So yeah. you can wrap them, wrap them all up. Um, I mean, those are just some different options. I basically hit the max that I had and I said, oh, I'll just pay these off. And then I, I jumped from there into investing as a limited partner in syndications yeah. from that point. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Cause my path was a little bit different. I didn't do any hard money whatsoever. I did private money, which is different yep. than hard yep. money. It's, it, it's mm -hmm. different because I do a lot of private money lending now and it's not hard money, um, right. but private money lending and then non QM came out, right. Non-qualified mortgages came out and I did a lot of, um, of that there. And I still do that kind of financing for people today in yep. non QM um, only for investors though. Right. And all the way up to 150, 200 units, which is oh, awesome. Yeah. Which yeah. is really exciting because there's a whole world of securitized mortgages out there for this type of investing. So, um, okay. So you went right into syndication. Now, are you man now? Well, let's take a second and explain syndication. I think that would be yeah. really good just in case people haven't been hearing it. I mean, it's a, it's a buzzword out there now, everybody and their grandpa mm -hmm. is a syndication partner, but maybe some people haven't heard about it. Yeah. So I, um, you know, like I said, we, I had my head, my head down and, uh, my mother passed away in December of 2011. And, during kind of this process, um, my second son was born a week later. 
my wife and I, we were, we were looking just, you know, at everything, our life, our finances, my wife's an architect and she goes back to work and we put both the boys into daycare. Yeah. And so they, they go to daycare and the, a year later we wrap up the financial year and we look at our taxes and I look and I was like, the number that stuck stuck out was negative eleven thousand dollars, and I kept looking at everything, yeah. and the negative eleven thousand dollars was how much money my wife made working. And wow! What I mean is, yeah, because of all her, daycare, it was her income yeah. minus taxes minus daycare. Yeah, and I'll never forget. And now imagine this: you have you have your your wonderful partner who is an architect who's gone to school longer than you for this. She yeah. has two children. And she goes back to work. And I said to her, Hey, it makes more sense for you to stay home <laughs> than to go to work from a financial perspective. Yeah. And I was like, do you want to do that? And she, she said, no. And now if you met my older son, you'd understand why she said that, but <laughs> I didn't want her to go. I didn't, I didn't want her to stay home either, frankly. So I said, okay, let's figure out a way to make this work financially as well. So we're just not taking it in the shorts, you know, yeah. from a numbers yeah. perspective. So she was working for somebody else. We said, okay, let's, let's build up your, your own personal business. And then also this is 2012. So, we, you know, we're starting to come right, out of the bottom of the last of the real estate cycle. Yep. yep. Good year. Yep. So, yeah. so we started buying land and building spec homes as well. Hmm. So during that process, we went to a meeting and we were, I was talking to a gentleman and I was like, yeah, we got these properties. And my returns had now really come down because I built all this equity in my portfolio. Instead of making 20 and 30% cash on cash returns, the returns on my equity now on the property were, were single digit returns yeah. for taxes. Yeah. Yeah. We're in a no very leverage. high tax bracket. No leverage. Yep. Yeah. No leverage. So I started to look at it and I was like, maybe this plan of paying these mortgages off wasn't <laughs> as good as I thought. <laughs> and he said, you should invest in apartments. And I was like, well, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. And he's like, well, talk to my, talk to my friends. They, they syndicate apartments. And I was like, syndicate. I was like, hmm. So I talked to him. What really stood out to me, Jen, was the demographics. I talk all about this in my book, like the numbers. I'm a numbers guy. Mm -hmm. I got into the medical device space because I looked at the baby boomers and I looked at the demographic trends behind them. And I said, if I'm going to work in a career, I want a 10 or 20 year trend that's going to push that. Yeah. I got into the apartment investing space because there was a 20 year trend towards renters. And we're seeing that now. Why are rents up 15% year over year? It's because there's a tremendous demographic wave that I talk about in my book that is pushing this trend. So yeah. I talked to this group, they syndicate deals. A syndication is simply having what are called general partners or managing partners and limited partners are essentially investors. Mm -hmm. So the general partners find and run the deal and the limited partners are kind of like silent partners. They're the money. They're little it. angel investors. Yep. Yeah. And the nice thing is if you were like me and you're working 60, 80, sometimes hundred hour weeks, you don't have to manage it and deal with calls from your tenants or even your, your company. That's Improvements or, mm -hmm. you know, crime, nothing, nothing. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, you know, what's crazy. It. Yeah. The returns were it. better. The returns were better than I was getting in my, my single family. Doing all that so, work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So long story short, it took us about uh, three years, two, three years, and we sold all of our single family properties and everything went into the uh, apartment, the multifamily commercial syndications. Yeah. And then ultimately my first partner and I, we syndicated our first deal in 2016. So we worked with the group that we were investing with, brought in our own investors, and then ultimately- okay. And now you're there. Yeah. Or have a Correct. team Yeah, or have a team to manage. Correct. So, right. yeah, I know. So I want to ask you some questions about that. Yeah. So listen yeah. in guys, because this is, this is really sort of where everybody's going right, right now. And the key is to find the, the best general partners that have the experience to be able to manage your money. Now, I also know Grant Cardone is doing this because I'm invested in one of his syndications. He's my one, one of the syndicate. I'm in two of them and he's, he's one of them. Um, and I know that he, all of a sudden he's advertising on the radio. He's trying to find more people to buy more of these, yeah. these, um, you know, these investments. I think the one that we invested in is like a $60 million property. You know, it's pretty yeah. hefty, but, um, when I want to talk about the team for a second, because, yep. you know, whether you are a real estate agent listening in and you're saying, Hey, maybe I could jump into some more commercial stuff. Now I would, I would recommend that you don't go from single family to 
150 units, I would try to find six units, nine units, 10 units, something like that to learn, learn the, how the, how this works, because there's a lot of like cash on cash internal rate of return, DSCR, right? There's a lot of things, a lot of new acronyms that you would be introduced to, but um, I want to know about your team that you put together that you felt like you really needed um, as an investor. Let's talk about the investor side of this. No one here is really going to be talking about the general partner piece of it, but as the investor, what what questions should we be asking those general partners? Like what team they have together, what experience they have, how often are you going to pay us? Is it going to be quarterly? Is it annualized? Is it reinvested? Is it monthly? Fill us in. Yeah. You don't know this, but we're actually coming out with a, a course on how to evaluate syndications, Jen. Awesome. So, yeah, yeah. So you can, I you love can email that. me. Yeah. So you can yeah. email me, uh, Chris at nextlevelincome.com, Chris at nextlevelincome.com. And you can just put course in the subject and I'm happy to send you some information when it comes out. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so we've, you know, what we found was investors struggle to, to figure out these questions. And I learned this a lot from my coaching clients. You know, they look at stuff and like, what questions do I ask, Chris? I'll yeah. never forget. I get sent this deal. And it was about a $20 million apartment complex, maybe, maybe a little bit bigger than that. Pretty, pretty big deal. And my, uh, this was a, a friend in a mastermind group. He said, hey, what do you think about this deal? And I sent back one question. And here's the thing. I didn't look at the deal. I just looked at where it was. The yeah. town was 25,000 people. And I'm thinking, who is going to rent in this little town? But more importantly, who's going to buy? So I sent back, I said, why are you interested in this town? It was in, I think, Alabama. And he said, I'm not interested. Like, I'm not particularly interested in this town. I said, well, the reason I ask is, is this, like, who's going to, who's going to rent? Who's, you know, who's demand? And then the other thing was he was looking at buying it himself. I said, who's going to run it? So those are your big questions. Okay. So first, first question you have to say is, why are you interested in, apartments or why are you interested in self-storage or why are you interested right. in short-term rentals like we were talking about before the show you yeah. have to have you know a reason that that strategy works the second question i would ask is is actually where yeah. where like what are some good areas and that can kind of go hand in hand with the who yeah. um but you know we like the southeast we like texas we like florida we like you know the carolinas georgia tennessee yeah. because there's a lot of people moving there um, you may live in an area of the country, like say Idaho, where we're not buying Idaho, but a lot of people may be moving there, like say yep, from no, California. Salt Lake's huge right now. Yep, Salt Lake, now. one of my favorite markets, Phoenix, yeah. another great market. We don't, yeah. we're, we're not there as operators, but yeah. they're fantastic markets. Yeah. Um, so, and then it's who, who's going to run this deal. Yeah. So like anything you have to say, Hey, Hey, Chris, what's your experience? How long have you been doing this? Yeah. We've, we're, we've done over 3000 units now in acquisitions over a billion dollars. We have a lot of exits. So you can say, Hey, like, why do you buy these deals? Why do you buy in this area? So if you're, if you're new and you're like, well, I'm not really sure what areas I heard Chris mention these areas, but you know, this, this operator is talking to me about Phoenix. You can ask the same questions. Why are you investing in Phoenix? Yeah. And it shouldn't be because I live here. They could say, hey, I live like I live in Asheville. I moved to Asheville because of the demographics. Yeah. Like that's I think that's a good reason, um, you know, but they should have a good explanation, not just because it's convenient right now. Once they're an experienced operator, you want them to have a presence in that market that's going to give them an advantage. So then you can say, OK, why do you invest in the area? What are your competitive advantages? Mm-hmm. You can ask questions like, how do you determine Mm-hmm. Uh, an area to invest like a sub market. Like you may say the Southeast, but then you may say, well, Chris, why Nashville? Like right. why Nashville, right. Tennessee? Like what are some right. good reasons that you're in Nashville? You know, does your team have experience running? So let's, we buy a lot of newer properties that are built in the last 10 years. You know, if you're with a group, maybe they buy a property that's built in the seventies. You know, we buy properties that are built in the two thousands. Why do you buy those properties? And Is that the types of properties that you own in the rest of your portfolio? If it kind of is in a different market than the rest of their portfolio and the property is not in the same shot to renovate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, you know, I've seen groups they're like, Oh, we do everything. We do development. We do, um, (laughs) you know, we do fix and flips and we do all this stuff. Like they they should really have a good track record in all of those different areas. And then, you know, then you start to get into questions about the numbers. So notice how, I didn't, I didn't ask about returns yet. 
Okay. Right. Because right. It's all the holistic pieces of it. The mind. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Because if you're, there was this episode in the Simpsons where they move Springfield. Well, I got news for you. You can't do that in real life. Like yeah. if you're three, two, 300 unit apartment building, it's in a bad market. You can't just scoop it up and move it to a mar new market right. that might work on the Simpsons. It does not work in real life. So yeah. you better be buying in the right market. Yeah. If your operator is not solid, you're going to have an even worse time getting away from that operator because you're basically married to them. These aren't liquid investments. Right. So you need to be right. sure about that. And then you start saying, hey, what is your strategy? What's your timeline? How do you work with investors? What do your returns look like? Yeah. And you want to... And that's, that's one of the reasons we're doing the course is to kind of figure out the nitty gritty because the unfortunate reality is an operator, I can tweak my spreadsheets and make them look as pretty as you want them to look. But you need to say, hey, here, you know, here's why we think we're going to get this sort of return. You know, it's based on this business plan over this period of time. Yeah. And when investors say, hey, what's the biggest, you know, what's the biggest question mark? You really, it's time. It's like, can we execute this business plan over two or three years? Is it, or is it going to take us five, six, or seven years? Because yeah. if we're going to create the same value with that business plan, it's like building a house. If you've, if you're listening, you've built a house. It, the house is going to cost you about the same amount of money to build, whether it takes you a year or two years, but it's going to end up costing you a lot more if it takes you two years because you got to pay interest, you're renting your other home, and you're dealing with all these other headaches. So you want an operator that can execute on a specific timeline that matches your preference as an investor. Yeah. And when you can start realizing the return on, on right. the money that you have. Yeah. Okay. So I have a couple of questions just to, to, um, because I know people are probably asking these questions, but, um, one, one very simple semantic question, uh, what's the average length that someone would have their money tied up? Great question. So that, and the answer is it depends. Uh -huh. So I know okay, I answer that all the yeah. time. <laughs> I even have That's a box of depends I have at my work. Oh. I, I bring them with me. And when people ask questions, I bring out the box and I go, what do you think the answer is? And they're like, it depends. Yeah. That's cute. I like that. I got to, <laughs> I got to, I got to start having that. Like having that with prop. you. Yeah. Yeah. A little prop. So, okay. So let's talk about, and again, I, I go through all this stuff. I go through my book. So if you're yeah. like listening, yeah. you're no, this, to is, yeah, and this down, is high level. Yeah. I don't want to get into the, weeds, yeah, grab but yeah. But you know, just the average. My book goes through it. So my book talks about a, the value add strategy. So we're buying properties, Jim, that are cash flow positive from day one. And right. we go in and we improve operations. We improve income. We usually are um, like we're, we're, we just bought this property in Savannah, Georgia. We're putting $12,000 per unit. We're, we're upgrading all the units so we yeah. can increase uh, rents to market levels there. So if you think about that for our strategy, let's say it takes two years to upgrade all those units three to five years is a reasonable timeline for investors to expect to have their money in a project before we finish the project, market it and sell it. Yeah. Now, yeah. the caveat is we don't know what the market's going to be like on the other end. We're yes. very confident in our strategy. We're, we've done it multiple times before. Our finishes are very standard. Mm -hmm. We know the market very well, but let's say we go to sell it and it's 2020. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. nothing was selling, like nothing yeah. was going out there. Nobody yeah. knew what the heck was going on. And a buyer isn't going to look and say, well, we know what the income is going to be next year. Nobody had any idea. So if we get to the end of our three-year period, it's 2020, it might be four or five years, um, like during yeah. the great financial. So you're doing you know, fix and flip process. basically more. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's like okay. fix and flips yep. on a grand scale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. So, and that's yep. something very important for us to understand because mm -hmm. the syndications yeah. I'm in are not fix and flips. They're buy and holds. Yeah. 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 So a buy and hold or momentum yeah. play, like we have yeah. some newer properties that we bought yeah. and, and we've, we've sold them in less than two years. Yeah. So, you know, it's, that's, if it's a development, so a development might not have any cash flow from day one. Oh yeah. You know, no. It might, no. It might, yeah. It might take two or three years to, to build. build it. Um, mm -hmm. Or, uh, yeah. and then there's also a fund structure and a fund. If you're acquiring multiple different properties, Typically, that's going to be an even longer period of time because you know it's going to take it's going to take even longer to unwind that fund. So you know there's yeah. there's some variation, but you know I say three to seven years and kind of the markets that we play in is a yeah. pretty realistic timeline. We usually say about five years. 
Yeah. Yeah. And then you pull your money out and you pop it right back into the next one. And that's what's so cool about it. Um, okay. So let's talk about where do you suggest that people get money to invest? Because people are going to be listening and going, I don't have any cash. Mm-hmm. What should I do? And obviously we're lenders and realtors. We're like, oh, go get a home equity line or a second mortgage. We get that. You can refinance and take cash out of your house. But there's other ways that you can get the money pulled together. So what are some suggestions that you're giving to your students? Yeah. So there's there's lots of different options for, for money out there. So you could, if you're like me and you have properties already, you could unlock some of that equity by selling a, a re- rental property or that you could refinance. Same return. <laughs> that isn't, yeah. So you can, you know, and you know, it's like lazy equity, right? So if yeah, you, you yeah. look, what I would look at is your return on equity. So yeah. return on equity is going to yeah. be your, your net cash flow after all your expenses every year. Mm-hmm. divided by the equity that you have in the property. Yeah. And if it's like mine, it was single digits, you know, we're typically seeing healthy double digit returns in, in our, our projects that we're doing. Yeah. So that's kind of a benchmark there. Every project's different, not specifically saying what type of returns you're going to get, yeah. um, but that's an option. Um, there's self-directed IRA. So I just spoke with an investor this morning. Yeah. Um, he has money that he, you know, you can move it from a 401k or yeah. a traditional IRA to what's called a self-directed IRA custodian. Yeah. And there's, there's some custodians um, that have been on the podcast, Next Level Income Show or nextlevelincome.com. You can check out the podcast and the blog. And it talks about how you can invest using a self-directed IRA. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look at the ultra wealthy, if you look at the rich, we're talking about nine figures plus, they typically put 20 to 30% of their money in income producing real estate. So from a portfolio allocation perspective, if, if you're one of those people that's worked for a long portion of their lives and you've built up a substantial 401k, you could look at maybe redirecting some of that money. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another area. Whole life. Sorry. Yep. I was going to say whole life falls right you're, in. You're, are you looking at my notes, Jen? No, I'm not. You're looking at my notes. <laughs> So because that's one um, of our vehicles. That's what we do. We don't do any 401ks at all. That's we my do favorite all one. Whole life. Yeah. That's my favorite one. I yeah. talk about in chapter three of my book, I call it my opportunity fund. Yeah. And what we do is this prevents what I call liquidity drag. So if you have money yeah. sitting in the bank, so like look, you, you may be listening and saying, oh, hey, Chris, I got a problem. I don't have any cash sitting around. Hey, there's another problem. I got too much cash in the bank and it lost 15% last year. Okay, ah. eight or 9% if you want to believe the government, Gosh. but I think it's more like 10 to 15. Yeah. How do you, how do you, get, how do you avoid that, right? Yeah. We, keep our, we keep a lot of our cash tucked away in the cash value of our life insurance policies yeah, I love it. and we can pull it out. And we actually use a special strategy called the investment optimizer approach. Mm-hmm. And we end up, we actually layer on a line of credit. So we have a lower cost of lending um, versus that, but that's a great, Options. So yeah. oh, equity God, and properties. So cool. I'm making money from myself while I'm the money's still there and I'm making money from mm-hmm. myself. I, I gave myself a loan and, and, you know, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. So, and then I'm making a good return on investment. Yeah. You're, I love it. You know, and look, I love if liquidity, my father, liquidity drag. I love that. Yeah. Liquidity drag. But my father passed away when I was five. So if you, if you're working on building a legacy for your family and yeah. you said, Hey, I have this 20 year strategy to build this wealth through real estate investments. What if something happens to you? along the way. That's, that's the thing people talk about, Oh, I can get a better return. Chris whole life insurance is not an investment vehicle. It is a vehicle to invest and it's a safety net. So you get a lot of value and people that say, Oh, I don't need that. Well, no one ever said, Hey, he or she had too much life insurance when they died. Have you ever heard anybody, anybody hear that? Right. No. No. Well, I was going to ask you how many policies do you have right now? We have four. We have seven. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. But we're, yeah. we're at the cap. I mean, we're getting to the cap. Like my husband can't get any, it all has to be for me. So now yeah. I am, this is why banks just everybody. So, you know, this is why if you work for a bank, you're the assistant to the assistant, to the assistant vice president, all these titles allow for banks to be able to take out life insurance policies with you because of that's you. Right. And they yeah. use that money to invest. There's all that's going on behind the scenes. And a lot of people don't mm-hmm. know that. So now I'm at the point where I'm saying, okay, so maybe the, probably in 2023, we're going to be moving into a W2 format for my business so that I can get some officers. on my staff. Yeah. Yeah. Look, yeah. it's, it is a wonder look, life insurance it's has, great. I'm not going to do an infomercial on life yeah. insurance, but again, 
just yeah. look at what the really rich families do. And they all Dave do. Ramsey, like they don't do what Dave Ramsey tells you to do. They don't pay off their homes. They don't do 401ks. They don't do term yeah. insurance. No, it's good for budgeting. They, it's good for learning how to manage your money. That's right. But that's it. They, yeah. they don't own their homes. Yeah. They invest in things like income producing real estate and they own tons and tons of real assets like yeah. whole yeah. life. Insurance. Every single president does this. Every one of them. Every one of them does it. There you go. Um, I love it. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so that's so that's good. So we were talking about where to get money. Now, the other thing I want to ask you just real quickly is that you casually mentioned this, but I want to talk about this because I um, I hold very high end masterminds. Um, so my minimum requirement is two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more a year for someone who's in sales or making you know an entrepreneur, a single entrepreneur. Um, so I hold these high masterminds. You mentioned you were in a mastermind. I'm in three of them. Why awesome. is it important to be in a mastermind? Yeah, look, I think um, if people ask me, Chris, like what, what mistake did you make early on? The mistake I made early on was not getting a dedicated coach that could really direct yeah. me and mentor me and yeah. teach me and bring me there. So I think coaching just in general is so important. And Jen, yeah. I know you believe this. I know you're, yeah. you have, I am a you coach. Have, uh, yeah. Ter- yeah. You have a terrific <laughs> right. program. And, and I got coaching too. Exactly. So yeah. it's important to have a coach. It's also, I think important to coach or to mentor. Yeah. If you say, hey, I want a coach, but to mentor, and that keeps you sharp because yeah. you have to say, Hey, what, what are those that I'm mentoring that I'm coaching? What do they need? What do they need to know right now? What are they going through? It helps you learn and stay on top of things. And then your coach gives you perspective as well. And the mastermind should be a layer of this. It could be in conjunction with your coach. So I do masterminds with my coach. I also have a mastermind I'm part of outside of of my 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 coaching client. It's called the passive income mastermind that I help found. And then I also have my own mastermind with my own coaching clients where we meet. So I have three different masterminds um, that I I participate in some way, shape or form. And again, the reason is like, remember I mentioned, I heard about investing in apartments through syndications at, it was basically at a mastermind that that I took my wife to. And look, you, you never know. That was probably the worst mastermind I've ever been a part of, but it was so impactful what happens. So if you have an open mind, if you're around people that are at a high level, like the mastermind that you host, Jen, you know, you want to ideally be not at the very bottom, not at the very top, but you want to be, you know, somewhere in there. So you can, you can add value, but you can also receive value from those. I think that's a really important aspect if you're looking at a mastermind to join. I, I totally agree. I mean, I totally agree. And it's funny you said that it just reminded me of something is that I heard about whole life in a mastermind. (laughs) <laughs> that's where I heard about it. Yeah. I mean, I'd yeah. heard about it before, yeah. you know, obviously, and it was like, oh, you know, whole life, small life, whatever. But I actually heard the whole concept of, you know, being your own bank in that, in that context of a mastermind. So and wonderful. I will tell you, even during COVID, you know, my business tripled during COVID amazing. because I was that's in amazing. a mastermind because I was yeah. in a mastermind. Right. Yeah. And I'm not talking about my coaching business. I'm talking about all my businesses. You know, I was able to utilize the, that mastermind to help me solve problems as we were making all those tr- pivots that everyone was using and it tripled. And, um, you know, I Maybe. just think it's really, really cool. Yeah, it's good. But thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I just, oh, yeah. it's good for, I think I, people to hear from yeah. someone other than me, the importance of masterminds. Right? Well, and I'll add one, one thing. I think what you find with people that seek out coaching and masterminds is a certain mindset yeah. and it's the abundance mindset. It people is. that say coaching's not worth it. You know, you shouldn't do that. Don't spend your money on that. Save, wait till you're 65 to retire. That's a scarcity mindset. Yeah. And you have got to run away from people that have a scarcity mindset yeah. and you have got to run towards and become a part of groups and masterminds and yeah. environments that where the abundance- mindset. Yeah, yes, it's a growth it's so, mindset versus so you know, sticking there. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, I think it's. I think it's super, super powerful. And the bottom line is, we we tend to be islands in the industry that we're talking in right now. Is yeah. right that everyone tends to be an island, and really that collaboration is so powerful, and it helps you with um, seeing the blind spots that you're not seeing, and so you can Absolutely. solve a problem in one conversation versus years and years of trying to figure things out. I just had that conversation with my coach. He recalibrated what was coming out of my mouth in a half an hour phone call that I've been working on for four years. Amazing. Right. There you go. 
I said, I can't believe it. You just said what I've been trying to say for four years. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. I love that. So how do people get in touch with you, Chris? I mean, obviously you've got something going on here and I know you have minimum investment requirements and things. I, I know that's another question everybody's going to ask, and I'm not going to hold you to that in, in this podcast, but um, safe to say so that everybody knows, you know, generally it's between, I, I wouldn't even say between generally it's around 50,000, give or take. I'll say it that. Yeah, we're seeing, we're seeing that. Um, and yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of an industry standard there. Yeah. Um, but look, if you're, if you're an accredited investor, you want to learn more about, you know, the projects we do, we do apartments, we do self-storage, we do hotels, we do mobile home parks. We also started up. Uh, <laughs> yes. And my favorite this year is car washes. We started a team um, that, that um, we buy and operate and pool car washes together. Wow. So if you want to learn about those, you can check out our website, nextlevelincome.com. Right. The blog's free. The podcast is free. The book is free. If you want to learn about our investments, click on the invest link and yeah. you can apply um, there to have a call. I'm happy to set up a call, explain a little bit more about what we do, see if it might be a good fit for you if you want to take a look at that. That's awesome. That is wonderful. Okay. A quote you'd like to leave us with. Yeah. So, you know, we mentioned, uh, I mentioned I lost my, um, lost my parents. I've lost my best friend as well. And you know, my, uh, his father has a quote that he put on Facebook and I think it's appropriate. It's, you know, um, plan as if you'll live for, or learn as if you'll live forever, but live as if you'll die tomorrow. And the point is Say that again, I want you, to hear that slower. Yeah. And I might be, I might be messing it up a little okay. bit, but you know, learn as if you will, will live forever. Right. Keep learning but live as if you will, die, you could die tomorrow. Oh, yeah. And I think the thing is you don't want to have any regrets. No. And when my, when my friend passed away, I said, I'm not going to live a life of regret. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the world we live in, Jen, I know, you know, this, if you're listening, I know you know this as well. You need money to do the things that you want to do and to be free. So Jen, you provide an amazing platform to help people create yeah. freedom. Um, financially, and hopefully um, some of the resources we have can help you as well. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. I have a quote called live your legacy while you're building it. It's the same thing, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's my quote, like live your legacy while you're building it. Why are you waiting? That's just crazy. That's yeah. awesome. Well, we'll have all the links below. We'll have it, you know, have the link for you um, for people to get in touch with you um, as well as all your social media and all that good stuff. And I would just encourage everyone to follow, to follow Chris, um, learn more. This is it. You know, I always say you learn, you, uh, you learn, you earn, and then you return, right? So we want to be always oh, learning. So we always want to be while we're earning, we're learning so that we can give back to ourselves and to others you know, as we um, progress and become older and, are, and more tenured in everything we do. And it will only make you a better uh, entrepreneur, a better expert in what you do when you have the knowledge around all of these different types of investing. And that's why we bring these in on occasion so that everyone can, can hear about it. So Chris, I want to say thank you again for being with us today. I learned a lot. I love what you're doing. I can't wait to get your book. And uh, thanks for, for what you're doing and, and creating all these opportunities for people. Wonderful. And Jen, thanks for the opportunity to be on here and share with your, your Absolutely. amazing audience. You do a phenomenal job with your platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, everybody, thank you again for listening in. And please don't forget to just take a second and scroll down on your phone and give us a great five-star rating and write something wonderful about Chris and about what you loved about this episode or what you like about any of the episodes or the podcast itself. And last but not least, don't forget to go to YouTube to our channel and subscribe to our channel. Make sure that you're watching us too, because you want to see Chris hold his book up. And uh, with that said, we'll see you next time on Mortgage Lending Mastery. Thanks for listening to Mortgage Lending Mastery. Be sure to subscribe to hear more sales tips, ideas, strategies, and tactics to help you with your personal and professional growth to multiply your results in record time. And if you like what we're doing, don't forget to give us a rating and review so we can continue to bring you the best content possible. Wanting more beyond the podcast? Join our Mortgage Lending Mastery membership community where you will find extended interviews with our favorite guests, weekly training, tips, and insider secrets, fireside chats with Jen, free content, meet, share, and collaborate with other members, and so much more. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about this exclusive content. Mortgage Lending Mastery is an industry syndicate charter podcast. Industry Syndicate is the first podcast network specifically for the mortgage and real estate industries. 
Get the Industry Syndicate app in the App Store or Google Play today.